Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, the weekly libertarian podcast that, unlike Morning Joe, still goes on after a near-miss assassination attempt on Donald Trump. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hello, everyone. Howdy. Is it too soon for a happy Monday? It's just Monday. Yeah. It's maybe yeah, not a happy Monday. Make every every Monday happy, Peter, as you well know. Uh, we're going to get into this uh, political violence in this country of America here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors, good friends over at Students for Liberty. The most important ideas are those debated on college campuses. Think about how many different fringe concepts initially spawned in the academy that are now prevalent across society. F.A. Hayek noticed this phenomenon. The ideas developed in academia soon spread to the rest of society. That's why Students for Liberty supports students like me in spreading the ideas of liberty on campuses. As a coordinator with SFL, I've hosted high-profile speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day, published magazines and articles to spread pro-liberty ideas, and helped organize and attend conferences on campuses around the world. SFL connected me with partner organizations, and thanks to SFL, I've been accepted to internships at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, National Review, the Cato Institute, and will start as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine this summer. My name is Jack McCastro, and I'm one of the thousands of volunteers from the SFL network building a freer future for people across the globe. Visit SpreadLiberty.org to discover how you can contribute to building a freer future at school and beyond. Okay, on Saturday, America came within an inch or two of being in an extremely dark and uncertain place after a 20-year-old sniper uh, shot the former and possibly future president, Donald Trump, in the ear uh, at a rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, in the process uh, killing one attendee and seriously wounding two others before himself being killed by the Secret Service. Uh, Trump very iconically raised his fist on the way off stage, yelling, fight, 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 as blood ran down the side of his face. As of 11 a.m. Monday, when we're recording this, we still don't know much about the shooter, aside from his name, that he appears at first glance to be a stereotypical loner weirdo, uh, was a registered Republican, but had given money to Democrats, was using his dad's gun, uh, and reportedly had explosives in his car, as per usual in just about every high-profile act of violence. You can bet that some of even those details that I just cited will later be proven uh, to be misleading or even flatly untrue. All of this comes before the Republican National Convention, which begins tonight in Milwaukee. Trump is already there, preparing to announce his vice presidential pick as soon as today, and has said that the shooting has impelled him to be uh, to rip up his speech and to be more conciliatory and, and unifying. Uh, predictably, there have been many fingers of blame pointed at the Secret Service for failing to uh, establish security around the perimeter. At local law enforcement for spotting the shooter but failing to engage before he pulled the trigger uh, at Joe Biden and the Democrats and the media for comparing Trump to Hitler for eight years. Uh, at libertarians and other Second Amendment enthusiasts for easing the availability of guns, and some have even laid partial blame on to Trump himself for adding to a climate of political hysteria and violence. Uh, Catherine, we're going to dive into some of those controversies, but first let's give you the 30,000 foot question, which is what does this assassination attempt say about America and what has now changed about America? So obviously, I, in uh, times of crisis, always turn to a source of comfort and warmth, uh, which is Ayn Rand. And uh, there does seem to be, it might be hearsay, but there does seem to be a quote from Rand, which was floating around a little, uh, that just says, this is America. This is not the way we do away with presidents. We vote. We don't kill people. And um, that's right. I mean, this is deeply, deeply troubling because we really do have a very clear procedure for what we do about presidents we hate, and it it ain't this. Um, and I think that the very, very rapid scramble to blame everyone for everything does not speak well of how this is going to play out. Um, it, it can't be everyone's fault. Um, and, uh, and I think now and always it is best to put the blame first and primarily with um, the shooter. Nick, the uh, pinned uh, tweet on your Twitter account is, and I quote, cover your ears, Fred Young, Jesus fucking Christ, the Ohio State University should be deeply embarrassed by this 
alum. You were referring to J.D. Vance, the U.S. senator and uh, possible, I think, likely vice presidential pick. Uh, after Vance had said that Biden's, quote, rhetoric led directly to President Trump's attempted assassination, end quote. Why do you think Vance is wrong? Uh, because to say that the rhetoric that Trump is Hitler, uh, which is actually not exactly what the Democratic Party was saying or Joe Biden was saying, but to say that that rhetoric led directly to Trump's assassination attempt is wrong. Um, and we should always beware of politicians who are starting to do not only tone policing, but ultimately it's going to be kind of speech regulation and things like that. We have been down this road before. Political rhetoric is often ugly. It's always divisive. People have been accusing Trump of being Hitler. People have been figuring the murder of Donald Trump and all of that kind of stuff. And yet the responsibility for the shooting is with the assassin. And as you were alluding to, Matt, and I think uh, Catherine uh, might have as well, we're going to find out that this person, whatever he is doing, it's disconnected from the political rhetoric of the moment. And if we are supposed to say you can never go, you, you can't be wildly invective in your political rhetoric, uh, where where does that end up? We went through this with the Gabby Gifford shooting, where Sarah Palin was accused of causing that assassin or that assassination attempt. She ended up being shot and damaged. Several people were killed in that shooting, and it turned out that her rhetoric had nothing to do with that. And in fact, the reality had nothing to do with that. And I am willing to bet right now that something similar will obtain in this situation. Just a quick follow up, Nick, that, you know, we you and I grew up in an era of a lot of political violence in the late 60s and early 70s. I wasn't really much around in the late 60s, uh, but that seemed to kind of end with the assassination attempts on Ronald Reagan in 1981. Um, kind of feels like it's coming back. There was the congressional baseball shooting. Uh, there was a attack. It's been kind of forgetting about by Lee Zeldin here in New York, a knife wielder. Uh, came at him. Uh, and now we have this. Uh, we have also seen in the last, you know, eight, nine years uh, on both sides, uh, Jay, Jay Rosen uh, warning, um, uh, at, I think an increased apocalypticism in rhetoric. Um, are those things unconnected? Yeah. Uh, and I'll point uh, to your uh, point on the 2023 American Value Survey, which is the most recent one. It was uh, released last fall. 23% of Americans agreed with the uh, with the idea that you may have to resort to violence in order to save our country, and that's up from 15% in 2021 among uh, among Republicans. Uh, up 30, it's at 33% up from 28%. Among Democrats, it's at 13% versus 7%. Uh, what I would argue, what is fundamentally different about the '70s political violence and the whole decade was one because you know there were two two attempts, one right after another against Gerald Ford, um, if you'll recall, uh, also disconnected from any kind of larger political motivation and things like that. What was different in a time like the '70s was the Cold War, the uh, the continuing and escalating political violence and terrorism around the globe from groups like the IRA and the PLO that were being funded by the Soviet Union or doing uh, you know, something in the context of the Cold War and a twilight struggle between communism and uh, the free world. We don't have that now. There's no question that uh, you know rhetoric has begun, been getting more and more apocalyptic. I've always spoken out against that. I think political violence always needs to be condemned without exception and without qualification. But I don't think that what we are going to see coming out of this is that the assassin was convinced by, you know, the new Republic cover of Trump as Hitler. And I think we should be very careful when we allow a politician like J.D. Vance, and there are other people on the left and all of that kind of stuff, when they start to say this rhetoric, if you, uh, because what he actually said was that Biden saying that Trump is a fascist totalitarian, this is the end of democracy if Trump wins a second term, that that is illegitimate political rhetoric? No, that's wrong. Peter, there's been a lot of uh, criticism at the Secret Service, even while praising the agents who uh, helped protect uh, Trump immediately up at the podium, uh, with the important caveat that none of us here are security experts um, Indeed. Uh, in that business. Um, but this looks pretty bad, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't look good. I mean, I mean it's... 
It's very strange to see the overhead maps of the site where the shooting took place and see that there was very clearly a low building rooftop uh, that was within sight of where the president was going to be speaking. And that rooftop was outside the security perimeter. There was no one posted on it. There were no snipers there, uh, uh, right? Uh, like actually on that on that rooftop. Um, and you would, uh, I have, you know, I have read, uh, again, I am not like a campaign trail reporter for the last several decades, but I've read multiple accounts from people who have covered presidents speaking at campaign events for years now. And they've all said, that's pretty weird that there was no one posted on that roof that the shooter was on top of. So again, I don't know exactly what happened. Um, I think I'm somewhat more uh, sympathetic to some of the complaints about, well, you know, they were warned several minutes in advance. Yes, in some ways, like this was probably preventable if they'd taken action quick more quickly. And so when I say I'm somewhat sympathetic, it's just that I can see, look, in the heat of the moment, you see a guy up there. Maybe does he have a gun? It's actually quite hard to tell. Uh, and there are some reports, though, that, you know, the, the Secret Service snipers held off for very briefly, uh, even though they'd uh, like they'd tentatively ID'd him because, in fact, sometimes they're looking Looking through a scope and they see a guy uh, trying to watch the president through a telescope and it's hard to tell a telescope versus a gun at distance and that sort of thing. Um, we need a lot of answers here. I think this pretty clearly did represent a security failure of some sort. Exactly what happened, we don't know yet. And it's probably going to be weeks, if not months or years before we have a complete rundown, um, a complete uh, investigation into what happened uh, last Saturday. Catherine, uh, let's have you take the uh, ritual bullet uh, for the gun control critique here. Isn't there something wrong with a system that allows 20-year-old creeps to get access to AR or whatever the hell? Uh, no, there's not. Uh, that system is guaranteed by our Constitution and uh, the vast, 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 vast majority of people who own that very same model of gun uh, use it for fun. They use it for recreation. They use it uh, in a safe and responsible way. Um, the argument here is the same as the argument for uh, why the war on drugs is a bad idea. Um, the costs of prohibition would be incredibly high, uh, would probably not prevent stuff like this, and would uh, violate people's constitutional rights. So, nope, this isn't about gun control. I do fear that one possible political outcome here, because Trump has always been a squish on guns, is that we end up with a Republican Party that is uh, more receptive to certain types of gun control measures. And I think that would be a bad thing for the country. So just one thing to note real quickly here is that a, the, the AR-15 style gun, the, the platform gun that was used has often been a sort of a target of uh, gun controllers, gun banners, uh, sort of as a you know, part of the assault weapons bans and everything. But if you if you somehow or another both banned the sale of new AR-15s and all, again, somehow or another managed to get all AR-15s out of the out of private hands uh, in, a, in a period of time and were able to successfully do that. That. Uh, you would still have an awful lot of sharpshooting rifles uh, that would have been, that might even in this case have been more accurate. You would have uh, millions and millions of those rifles, especially out in rural Pennsylvania. And the idea that you can stop uh, violence by targeting one particular type of gun, mostly as Jacob Solom has pointed out uh, over the years, just because it looks scary is is really pretty bizarre. I also want to say, just in our discussion here, we've we've used. You almost can't avoid it when you talk about gun control. Every headline is a pun. Every reference has a double meaning. You know, take the bullet, target, etc. Um, our language is very, very full of war metaphors. Our language is very, very full of metaphors that have to do with violence and, by the way, food. That's basically what our whole language is built on. Also and sports. Sports is just violence. Sports falls right under the violence subheading. And... Um, you know, this is this is worth keeping in mind as everyone goes hunting for up, oh, see, hunting for um, people who used words that sounded like maybe they wanted to kill someone um, as we try to look for who's responsible for this um, assassination attempt, because all of our words sound like we're looking to kill someone. And I just think that's super important to keep in mind. Just like to issue in a correction, uh, baseball is not violence because as George Carlin taught us, baseball is played in a park. 
Uh, uh, Nick, uh, I spend a lot of time trying to teach my nine-year-old, especially when traveling on airplanes across the country, not to catastrophize constantly about every possible worst-case scenario. Uh, however, we're about one inch away from a pretty worst case scenario, which is that an assassin blew Donald Trump's brains out. And I'm sorry for the explicitness of the language, especially given the 50 year old girl dad who died, which is just horrible. Um, but maybe it's worth like preparing ourselves mentally as a, as a precautionary measure, um, a wake up call, perhaps, uh, what, ha what would have happened or, you know, what do you worry about at the extreme end of the possibility parameters here? Uh, what I worry about is, uh, what the philosopher Giorgio Agamben would call a, a permanent state of exception that, uh, we've already seen this constantly. Uh, Matt, you and I in the Declaration of Independence talked about how, and you know, which, was which came out in 2011, 2012, so a long time ago, we had already been governing constantly, lurching from one emergency to another in the 21st century. And that has only continued and even accelerated since then. Um, and that's what I worry about the most, is that if something like, if Donald Trump had been killed, uh, to be honest, even in a, in, a, in a possible way, if Joe Biden dies before uh, the election, assuming he's going to be the Democratic nominee, that people will say we have reached a point now where the normal rules cannot apply and we have to go into a state of exception uh, and th everything is suspended. Uh, that's what worries me the most, because we have already in many profound ways, uh, if uninteresting ones or unexciting ways, you know, we no longer do budgets the way that we're supposed to. We, know do, we no longer do so many basic ways of governing that are so supposed to be done through democratic uh, kind of election and transparent movement and you know open meetings and things like that. That's something people would say, okay, something has changed fundamentally here. The fact is with assassinations as well as attempted assassinations, we've known how to keep moving. And I think we will, and I'm heartened. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that Trump seems to be, he was going to be striking a different note tonight than he might have absent. And uh, you know, one of the things I also want to say, among all of the obscenities in this, is uh, the people who are blaming Trump for somebody trying to kill him. Um, you know, this is where the recursion, the recursiveness of stupid political rhetoric, which has been dumber and dumber and dumber my entire life, gets totally out of control. Where it's like, you know, who's to blame for somebody trying to kill Donald Trump? Donald Trump. You know, it's like. I don't know. I, I'm going to stick up for recursion and I'm going to find ways to fold that into my day to day life. Um, uh, Peter, um, in the wake of any kind of uh, situation like this high profile political uh, act of violence or or just trauma, um, you will typically see and you are seeing right now a lot of uh, non lefties point out that there is a pretty glaring media double, double standard at play with the way that it is treated, talked about. Um, and you just, you know, Nick alluded to the Gabby Giffords shooting before, you know, famously Sarah Palin was blamed for this somehow because of a Facebook ad. It didn't make any sense uh, then or now. Um, and even though Republicans are some of them are switching sides like J.D. Vance, um, uh, more commonly, you will see people just say if the shoe had been on the other foot, we'd have it be an entirely different national media conversation than we see right now. Uh, is there something to that? Do, do you think the media is living down to its uh, kind of expectation as being um, a, unable to have a kind of even keeled uh, a way of presenting facts in a precarious circumstance. I think the best way to think about that question is somewhat annoyingly, these comparisons are always a little bit uh, tendentious, right? But to just imagine what if exactly this had happened, except it had been Joe Biden and not Donald Trump. Imagine the coverage that you would have seen. Imagine the tenor of the rhetoric after that. Imagine how many stories, uh, how many op-eds, how many tweets there would have been from the from the 
the Democratic Party establishment through, but then through the media and the and the 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 media's the Democratic Party's base in the media um, about you know how we need to talk about how we have a right wing violence problem, how we need to talk right, just like they would have instantly made it a a, a simple partisan political issue before we knew anything except oh there's a bullet that grazed uh, you know that grazed a presidential candidate or a president's ear right, and I think that. Like it again, we don't know because it, that's not what happened, right? It's always counterfactuals are always a little bit dicey inherently. And sure, maybe, maybe it wouldn't have looked like this because we don't, in fact, have a clear sense of the shooter's motivation here. But I, I do think it's fair to say that we would have had a different response from the media um, and from mainstream institutions that have a kind of left leaning valence. Uh, if this had been, if it, if it had been a, a Democratic candidate, uh, if it had been President Biden rather than Donald Trump. That said, I think a lot of what we have seen from the media, um, including from major organizations, you know, the, the MSM that people complain about, has been pretty responsible in a lot of ways. Um, they were, the, you know, the relatively accurate news mostly got out quickly, especially after about the first 90 minutes. Yes, um, I think there were some some bad headlines in that first hour, some some bad things that said, oh, look, maybe uh, the Secret Service is saving Trump from falling or something like that, I think was a CNN headline at Please fact check me. I'm not quite sure that that it might have been a different outlet. Um, and so there was, but that, but the first hour of something like this is always incredibly difficult to cover. And within two to three hours, it was pretty clear what the outlines of the situation were, um, and we were getting r essentially factual um, and and cautious, uh, but um, but steady drips of news as it was coming out. And so I, you know, I, I think in some ways the media has covered this pretty straightforwardly, and we know what happened, and uh, and we've gotten good information. On the other hand, I, I do think that the 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 discourse, um, the the tweets would be different if it were not Donald Trump who had been grazed by a bullet, but uh, someone with a D after their name. Catherine, to put a button on this segment. Uh, I know that you want to abolish most parts of government, but let's pretend for a second you didn't. Um, should RFK 2.0? get a Secret Service detail. So I do think that this is uh, such a case of Hanlon's razor with the Secret Service, if I had to guess, right? This is uh, always assume that things can be explained by incompetence rather than conspiracy. Um, not to say that conspiracies don't sometimes happen. They do. But uh, my guess is the Secret Service screwed up, not the Secret Service was part of a vast web of conspirators. Um, and so I think with that in mind, like, sure, give everybody Secret Service details. But I assume at least one reason that we don't do that is because uh, maybe our resources are not, um, you know, adequate to the job. So it's just a fair question to be like, are we are we giving RFK Jr. Secret Service protection and then the major candidates have less? I don't know. I have no idea how that staffing works. But if that is the case, that's a fair question. Um I think that, you know, you, of course, get down to the question of other independent candidates, right? Like, obviously, people have a habit of assassinating Kennedys in a way that uh, makes RFK Jr. particularly uh, wary. But um, what about Chase Oliver? What about Green Party folks? What about other independents? There's just, you know, there, there's always going to be another another marginal person uh, on this question of, of Secret Service details. So, sure, Maybe give them, we, give them we protection, need... but... We need the auxiliary Secret Service staffed well, solely by Vermin Supreme um, yeah. to uh, to uh, well, dissuade people with his boot head. Yes, Nick. There is, uh, you know, George Wallace was uh, crippled. He was paralyzed by an assassination attempt while he was running for president. Uh, and, you know, that both highlights the question of who deserves a, a Secret Service um, coverage, but also what are the motivations of assassins? Um, and it is... You know, I, to go back to, you know, where we started with this, Matt, tying in the work of literally uh, the no a number of people that you can count on one at tops two hands over the course of American history and tying that into the rhetoric of the moment 
is a ridiculous uh, connection to make at any given point in time, especially if you are doing that in order to police and control and silence critics or people making political speech, which happens all the time. Uh, there was a, a, a there's a fantastic piece which we can link to in the notes by Joseph Campbell about how. Uh, William Randolph Hearst was blamed for the assassination of William McKinley because Ambrose Bierce wrote a uh, quatrain attacking uh, William McKinley. Uh, and it turns out that the, you know, the assassin of McKinley had obviously never read that, may not have even been able to understand English properly. Um, so let's, you know, when, when it gets to the question, not of is political violence bad? Yes, always and everywhere in a democracy. When political violence becomes the, the the way that you change things, we are no longer living in a democracy. Uh, but when we start talking about how we have to monitor our thoughts and change the way we speak in order to avoid the actions of madmen, uh, we've gone we've gone off in the wrong direction. So people need to watch what they say about dangerous political rhetoric. Uh, I think that there was a um, uh, you know it's a good point, Nick, but uh, there was a climate of of quatrains back there that uh, maybe the assassin was yeah no well it, it was the uh it was the climate of right-wing hate i mean literally this is what people were saying when kennedy was assassinated it was the climate of right-wing hate in dallas what that killed kennedy a communist <laughs> pull the trigger yeah. it is crazy all right we're yeah. gonna pivot to uh joe biden's big boy press conference here in a moment but first a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. friends you ever feel like you need to get something off your chest, like PTSD from previous major party political conventions, guilt over enjoying your 16-year-old's hilariously inappropriate political TikToks, or just the fatigue of carrying more familiar responsibilities than you think your little shoulders can bear? Well, it's time to unclog those emotions, perhaps with a licensed professional who can help you break down those burdens into a more manageable battle box. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy-to-use, super-flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast do the necessary release work in order to more smoothly get through their day. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, and if you don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you get it all out with BetterHelp. Just visit betterhelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. It already feels like one or two lifetimes ago, but President Joseph Robinette Biden uh, the second on Thursday held his first press conference since his miserable debate performance against Donald Trump. The uh, 45 minute exchange with reporters, which was uh, which is an extremely rare uh, occurrence during this presidency, was greeted by many in the press as a return to form like a Paul McCartney 1980s record, uh, even a masterful foreign policy performance. We will talk here about the style points, which is what everyone was obviously keyed in on. But I thought for fun, we might even look at the substance, which was supposedly super great. Uh, so uh, whether it's at the press conference or at his uh, next day, big second agenda unveiling speech at a rally in Wisconsin or even um, his kind of uh, brief remarks in the Oval Office about the Trump assassination attempt. So, Catherine, why don't you lead us off? What's one policy related aspect to what Joseph uh, Biden has been uttering into cameras uh, since Thursday of last week that is of interest to our listeners? I think the continual insistence that we're somehow going to get back to a version of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that existed uh, maybe never, but maybe 20 years ago is the thing that was so striking to me. He's still a two-state solution guy. He's still talking about that conflict as if everything that has happened since October 7th isn't real to him. Um, and I think that it it highlights his age. Um, you know, he said his views a long time ago and he's not really going to change them and he's not really available for new inputs. But um, it also just reminds us that maybe that solution was never workable. Even when he was young and vital and had all his brain cells to think about that solution, it's not clear that that's the one he should have come to. So uh, the continued insistence on the two-state solution, which is very clearly not a solution at this point, and maybe never was. Peter, what's a chunk of substance that caught your eye? So 
President Biden has been running on a, a whole big policy agenda that includes a bunch of stuff like passing the PRO Act. But the one I want to focus on here is that he keeps saying we need to end medical debt. Now, this is an outgrowth of a proposal that the Biden administration has been pushing uh, for several years. His press release is going back to at least 2022, uh, talking about how they're actually going to uh, prohibit credit uh, credit score companies from taking a, a look at medical debt when they put together your credit score. But now we see that they want to go a little bit further than that. And the details are, are not entirely clear, but uh, there's a, a release from Kamala Harris's office, actually, that's uh, that talks about, this is a quote, leveraging public dollars to purchase and eliminate medical debt. Now, again, we have no real details on that, but it sounds like that means they're going to spend a bunch of money to try and get rid of this debt. We don't have a dollar figure on that. Um, and this really seems like a combination of Biden's approach to healthcare generally, as well as his approach to student loan debt, where you sort of take something uh, or, where you know you, you just spend a whole bunch of money. Um, you know, uh, you run, it's not quite a, a big government program in the sense that, say, Obamacare or Medicare are big government programs, but these are big spending packages or sort of big spending initiatives that are designed to pull debt out of the system. And look, nobody likes having medical debt. And in fact, paying medical bills is kind of annoying because the medical, uh, the, the doctor's office will never give you the bill while you're right there and just let you put your credit card down and pay it. They send it six weeks later after promising that, right? Like it's crazy. The, it's totally frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating. I have been frustrated uh, by, a, by a bunch of these bills. At the same time, like when you go in and get medical service uh, that you are supposed to pay for, that is an agreement to pay for it. And and it sort of seems like this is, I don't want to, I don't, this is an exaggeration when I say this, but this is like the, like a baby, baby, baby steps towards kind of nationalizing the, the whole medical financing, right? Like that's, that is what Biden wants to do without actually doing it. And he's going to take every little tiny step that is short of a big step uh, around the edges, uh, you know, at the margins to try and to try and just say, well, you know, we're just not going to have any kind of real kind of private payment uh, or, or system of private payment. Because what does private payment rely on is when somebody says they're going to pay, they actually have to pay out of their own pocket or the insurance company that they are paying has to pay out of their pocket. One of those two things. It's not that the government steps in a uh, uh, some years later and and buys that up for you. And so uh, it is, I think it's of a piece with what we have seen um, from Biden on student loan debt and on healthcare generally, which is, let's just see if we can spend a bunch of money, um, have some giveaways and we're, it, say, you know, look, we're, we're benefiting the middle class. Nick, what's a piece of uh, policy that Joe Biden has uh, talked about in his public remarks over the past five days that has caught your attention? Uh, you know, my uh, thing is the way that he substituted uh, his vice president, Kamala Harris. He substituted Donald Trump, uh, you know, as well as he, <clears throat> you know, uh, switched uh, who runs uh, Ukraine and who runs Russia. It is hard for me to get to the substance issues, uh, Matt, because uh, uh, because the, the style is is the problem. The reason he was speaking in all of these instances was to reassure at least Democrats, because he's obviously not reassuring anybody else, that he has at least some of his marbles. And he failed at that spectacularly, which you can read through all of the coverage. Um, but beyond that, on a, on a, on a kind of meta substance level, he could have explained that he was, re he, he represented a return to normalcy. There are ways that he could paint a very positive picture about the past four years and that he came in at one of the most fucked up uh, moments in American history. And actually, almost all major indicators are better now than the, than they were when he took office. And he was incapable of doing that. So I, I think it's worth going back here, if we're going to talk about style, to the point where Biden says, uh, I think it was during one of the debates um, as he was running, I am the Democratic Party. Because what we are actually seeing here as the debate about Biden's age and infirmity is going on is is the reverse, is that it, instead of the, the Democratic Party being a kind of uh, you know body and he's the head and just they're just doing what he says and the the party has become you know the, the Biden like Biden's wishes it really seems like the reverse is happening no it's not just that it seems like the reverse is happening it's that Biden's staff 
is explicitly, as far as I can tell, at least through back channels, making the argument that Biden's infirmity doesn't matter that much because the staff apparatus, the White House, all of the all of the bureaucrats, they can all they're in charge and they can make the decisions and they can make all of this work. And that's not how it's supposed to work. We didn't elect those people. The it is Biden who is who is president and who is running for president. And we have a situation in which the the actual president, it, like they're kind of making the argument that he's it's not quite that he's an empty vessel, but the, that he just sort of does what, uh, you know, that, that the staff, may, right, like the decisions are, and are, are made by the staff and he can just sort of come in and say, OK, no, maybe uh, choice A rather than choice B. But it's fundamentally a staff operation. And that is not how it's supposed to work. And it is really strange to see that, especially after Republicans made that argument during the initial Trump years. And Democrats was like, that's crazy. That's bad. We shouldn't have a president who can't be president. I, I think, you know, another way of saying that, Peter, that uh, gets to what uh, is actually going on in terms of politics is that Trump is the Republican Party at this point. Whatever he says, you know, we're at these these two parties no longer have co they don't represent coherent, uh, uh, a, co a coherent group of interest groups. Um, and, but whatever Trump says becomes what Republicans believe and they fall into lockstep. Biden does not have the charisma or the power or the energy to do that with the Democratic coalition. The Democratic coalition is not willing to fall in line, which is one of the reasons why uh, on things like Israel, for instance, and a variety of policies, he has spent more money. I mean, this is one of the things that his champions say. He has passed more major legislation in four years than than Lyndon Johnson did. You know, he, he's like FDR, and it's still not satisfying large parts of the Democratic coalition, uh, he can't pull off what Trump has pulled off. Building on Peter's point, the couple of things that I found jarring uh, about this sort of like uh, the puppet president uh, sense was that his literal first words of the press conference is that I got this list here that I've been given of all the people I'm going to call on. Um, I didn't like that too much. Um, and uh, at some point he uh was uh, talking about how uh, he was like uh, talking about his staff and that they basically kind of leak too much information. And then he said, oh, I'm going to get in trouble with Jill on that. Uh, and he just kept bizarrely cutting off his uh, uh, thoughts in mid-sentence by saying, anyway, uh, which really gave the impression that he saw someone in the crowd making the finger against the throat uh, like a gesture when he was rambling on about like uh, chip factories in South Korea or Hong Kong or wherever the hell he was talking about. Um, so uh, all of that was kind of distressing on the on the actual like policy front uh, rather than some of his slogans such as we're going to end corporate greed. He really said end corporate greed. It's crazy. Uh, and also control guns, not girls. He just sort of screamed out towards the end. Um, but actual policy, he at some point said, um, we no longer live in a Cold War universe. The uh, post-war order is kind of uh, over. And uh, so what's going to replace it? And was, I'm, I was in their audience going, hey, I'm glad to hear that conversation. Of course, he didn't say anything about what's going to replace it he just says uh, i have an idea and the you know the opponents don't have an idea um anyway. i don't think i don't think anyway <laughs> <laughs> uh anyway uh i think that that is a a, a brilliant encapsulation or succinct encapsulation encapsulation of well, what's wrong with the kind of uh, fatigued atlanticists uh who are trying like uh like hell to fight against the the populace such as Donald Trump and and other people in in Europe like uh, Viktor Orban, um, they just say that we got to keep doing this because it's been what we've been doing forever. Um, and they are not articulating uh, a, a new vision that has anything to do with reconnecting with a kind of democratic legitimacy that these institutions need, or else they are going to wither away uh, one by one. Uh, all right, um, as uh, uh, previously uh, teased, you know what? Actually, before that, um, just quickly. Um, based on all of that, um, uh, and especially based on his kind of cognitive performance, um, in, including his uh, you know, his battle box uh, uh, comments about uh, Donald Trump, I've repeated that phrase I think three times, and they even included it on their like Twitter brag feed. Uh, uh, is is this I'm, man I'm just to disappointed that this is not going to give us like a like a street battle wrap off, right? That, that like every time I've heard that phrase, it's, just, it's like, I, I want to see step up two, but with no. Biden and Trump AI'd into the main roles, right? Doing the break dancing. 
The place I went with it is my my son is at Battle Bots Camp this week, uh, oh. where they like build the little machines and smash them into each other. And that I'm like, let's settle the presidential election that way. Honestly, uh, is he Catherine Biden? Meaning not your son. Uh, <laughs> is he fit to be the president, let alone the candidate for president? I don't know. It seems like absolutely everyone no. on the table is bad. Is he worse than the other people who might be president? That's not the question. I still don't think so. Uh, it, are there any of them fit to be president? No. Now, also I not go the back question. To my previous. Like just. I go just back like to my previous. President Brain Cheese. Is he fit right now, given his state, to be president? Yes or no? What no. say you, Catherine? No. No. Nick, do I hear a no from you? Uh, no, I think he is. I think because by definition, he is if the Democratic Party nominates him, period. I would love to see both mean? him and Trump before every debate or maybe twice a debate. They have to do one of those online capture tests where it's like, okay, mark all the squares that have bicycles in them. Uh, and if they can pass that, then they can continue I don't think we're worried talk. that they're bots. That, Although, again, battle bots would be a good no. way to resolve no, this but presidential yeah, he election. Is. He is. Matt, he is brain dead. But that is not the question. The question is, you know, can he be elected and could he, could he run the country if elected? Yes. If the Democrats uh, put him forward, he's, he's qualified. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, don't know. I don't question. think I would vote That's for That's not the question I answered no Wilson. to. Anyway. Sorry, Catherine, can you repeat that? Second term, Woodrow Wilson, is it like first term, second term? I don't know, you know. You like Woodrow Wilson's early stuff? Uh, yeah. Not I, sure. You know what? I like uh, Warren G. Harding's second term. That would have been that would have been the ultimate presidential term. Yeah, I, I think Nick's answer, I actually disagree with this. Uh, fitness is not determined simply by the will of the voters or the nomination of the party here. You know, we talk a lot about the presidency as the as, as a, a kind of the, the person who sits atop the regulatory apparatus, the the policy influencer decider, right, who even if he is not uh, casting a vote in Congress, his party in Congress is following his lead. And that is obviously true. Um, that is a big part of being president. But the other big thing about being president is that the, that job in the constitutional system resides in the person of one man or one woman, of one individual for a reason, which is that in moments of crisis where time is of the essence, that is the person who gets to make the insta-snap decisions. And one of the things we are hearing from Biden, it's not just that he seems slow or out of it sometimes in public appearances. It's, it's not just that he has bad days. It's that he is complaining that his staff is overscheduling him. He was tired 12 days after an Air Force One flight to Europe. And he's saying, well, maybe I need to not have events after 8 p.m. I am sorry, but you sometimes might have to be president and make a big decision after 8 p.m. And if you are telling us explicitly that you are not capable of doing normal stuff after eight o'clock in the evening, you are not fit to hold the office of the presidency. Wow, Peter Suderman sounds like a uh, fascist yeah. enabler. But we do, uh, we have a constitutional process in place for that, right? I don't think that either of us are saying if elected, he was elected unconstitutionally. We're, the question is, is he is he capable of doing the job to a standard that we would like to apply? And I think that's yeah. clearly no. Uh, what do you right. and Trump is that? No, uh, I don't think he's capable either. Okay. To be well, let's pivot to clear. Trump. Uh, as teased previously, the Republican National Convention begins tonight in Milwaukee, oh uh, Wisconsin. A reason has a crack team of reporters. I'm not talking about the drug necessarily. Uh, on the ground, uh, keep uh, mashing the refresh button at reason.com for their reports. In advance of uh, this particular political infomercial, the GOP has, for the first time really since 2016, uh, updated its party platform. Uh, so let's go around the table and talk about some of the stuff that's in there and what it might say about a second Trump administration, uh, the future of the Republican Party, uh, and various impacts on the country and libertarian values and preferences and so forth. Peter, why don't you lead us off? 
Yeah. So uh, there's been a change to the the way that the platform describes how uh, the Republican approach to Social Security and the old uh, platform said basically, you know what, Social Security is in trouble and we're going to try to do something about that because it's in trouble. Like maybe we're going to rejigger the benefits and the financing mechanisms so that it actually has the amount of money that it needs to fund its obligations. That was the old position. And maybe you could argue, okay, maybe they shouldn't even be doing that. Like that's, uh, they're just trying to solve the math problem. You know, the entitlement's just too big and, and it's terrible, right? Like that's maybe not the the most libertarian position in the world, but like they at least were like, you know what? The trustees are like, we're going to run out of the fake money that we've been using to pay for this. We should probably have enough fake money. And now they're like, no, we don't, we don't even need to have the fake money to pay for it. We're just, we're never going to do anything because it's sacred. And this is, okay, they don't quite use the word sacred, but that is basically the position that Trump has has taken here and that has dragged the Republican Party towards in the way that Nick was talking about, is that the, the party just follows whatever it is that Trump said. And Trump was has been saying since he started running for president in 2015, you know what? We, we can't do any, we would never touch Social Security. We'd never change the benefits because, you know, our seniors are too important to us. And the that is now the platform position is we're not going to do anything about it. But guess what? If you don't do anything about it, some, it, something gets done to it anyway, which is it runs out of money and can't pay all of its bills. And so as far as we can tell, the Republican plan is to let Social Security run out of money so it can't so it can no longer pay all of its bills. Catherine, uh, you're a lady. Was there any lady related bits in the platform that you found of interest? Um, I don't know. I'm not really that interested in the lady, lady bits. bits. I, yeah. I, yeah, I wish I hadn't said <laughs> you know, that. You know, you're missing out on sentence. a whole world of fun, Catherine. Okay. Okay, everybody. I actually <laughs> uh, did not do a control F for any lady words. I did do a control F for the words debt and deficit and would love to talk about those, but um, it's up to you because you're the moderator, Matt. Yeah. Thanks. I was just going by what people said on Slack, but you go for it and say whatever Oh, you want. thanks. Cool. Okay. So um, there's only uh, one use of the word deficit. It refers to trade deficits, which as we've established before, Donald Trump doesn't actually understand the difference between budget deficits and trade deficits. So that's cool. The word debt Would doesn't you say appear. he has a cognitive deficit? Shut up. Shut up. Yeah. Wow. The word debt doesn't appear. Uh, chapter three, build the greatest economy in history is, uh, yes. is a section of this platform. And, you know, there's some decent stuff in there. Cut regulations, make tax cuts permanent, uh, you know, champion innovation. Uh, nowhere, nowhere do we mention where is the money that we're going to use to run the government coming from? Nowhere do we have any kind of uh, hint that that might be a major issue that a president in 2025 would have to deal with. Also, champion innovation is the last section. And there are three points. Crypto, AI, space. On the one hand, I love it. On the other hand, what? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> what? Okay, but uh, Catherine, what if that was the whole platform? What if it Honestly, was just champion yeah, innovation yeah. and it had those three bullet points and nothing I would, else? I would hey, you maybe we shouldn't be using like the a term MAGA bullet hat points. wearing. That's my platform for Reason Magazine in the coming yeah. years, but it should not be the Republican Party's platform. Nick, did you see anything of the platform worth discussing? Yeah, you know, Kovefi uh, shows up at least 15 times. This is one of the functions of, uh, you school. know, being able to digitally search documents. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, what for me, what was uh, what I looked at was the immigration policy, because this has been heated. Trump's absolutely ugliest rhetoric, I think, uh, has always been about immigrants. Uh, you know, I, he barely got off the escalator before he, you know, laid into all of those Mexican uh, drug dealers who were also disease ridden, um, you know, coming across the border on immigration. Uh, their main points are they're going to secure the border, which I think makes sense. Uh, we need to have some kind of order, uh, you know, around the country. Uh, we need to have some way of knowing who's coming into the country and things like that. Uh, then in all caps, they talk about uh, we will uh, they promise to carry out the largest deportation operation in American history. This goes back to, you know, uh, a parent vice president or, or a highly likely vice president, J.D. Vance, has been talking about, you know, we need large scale deportations in the country. We have a history 
of large scale deportations in the during the depression of Mexicans, as well as uh, in the uh, wonderfully named Operation Wetback in the 50s, when uh, uh, something like one and a half million Mexicans were deported. Um, if they're talking about breaking the record there, they're going to be talking about, you know, getting rid of more than one and a half million people from the country forcibly in an age of social media and in an age of due process. Uh, that will be a very, very ugly and horrifying spectacle uh, to behold. Um, so I'm, I'm deeply worried about that. The Republican Party, the way that it has kind of lost its way on immigration is one of the most deeply disturbing uh, developments of the past 30, 40, 50 years, even at this point, or whenever, you know, uh, whenever, uh, since 1980, certainly. Um, the other thing that they did say, uh, without any um, details, is that they were going to prioritize merit-based immigration. That might not be a terrible thing if, in fact, they were talking about increasing, like if there was some specifics to say we're going to increase the ability of people to come here legally uh, and be able to work and live openly. Uh, Trump on the uh, all uh, call in podcast or whatever the fuck it's called, the one with the Silicon Valley guys did all in. Thank you. Uh, did say um, that, uh, you know, he he was OK with the idea of giving people who get associates degrees, uh, bachelor's degrees or advanced degrees, automatic green cards. That's actually a good start on immigration liberalization. Uh, it should not be the whole thing by any stretch. But uh, the immigration section is deeply worrying because it plays to the worst elements, not just of contemporary populism, but historic populism in America. Uh, so I did the control F exercise as well. Uh, and, uh, uh, some words that did not show up anywhere in the document, NATO, uh, Russia or Ukraine, uh, nowhere in the Republican party uh, platform. If you do the word foreign, it almost all refers to the aforementioned border issue or tariffs. Um, the exception is, uh, down near the bottom. We see that um, uh, Republicans will strengthen alliances, okay, uh, ensuring that our allies must meet their obligations to invest in our common defense. So, okay, that's a reference to NATO, and Trump will browbeat a little bit more strongly than before, perhaps, than uh, he did for people to pony up. And then they also say, and by restoring peace to Europe. That's interesting. Um, where's the war in Europe, and how are you going to restore it? Uh, they don't get to the how. Um, in general, um, the critique, and this is pretty typical of not just Trump, but just kind of the uh, Jacksonian, Andrew Jacksonian uh, approach to foreign policy. It's to say that the Biden administration's weak foreign policy has made us less safe and a laughing stock all over the world. Um, so it's just uh, we're going to do peace through strength. We're not going to tell you anything else more about that except rebuilding our great military uh, and such. Uh, so I found that of of note, um, the emphasis on foreign policy is not much of an emphasis on foreign policy in the party platform. Uh, all right, let's go to our end of uh, podcast, what we have all been consuming. Nick, I understand that you were attending a conference involving a lot of libertarians over there in Las Vegas. Do you wish to uh, give us a report? Yeah, sure. I just came back from Freedom Fest, which is the annual gathering of mostly libertarians and conservatives, typically in Vegas, where it was this year, the previous year it was in Memphis. Next year, apparently, it's going to be in Palm Springs, Matt Welch. Oh, hey, so, uh, maybe uh, you will be uh, you will be the person who let's um, not get excited is the biggest face of freedom and reason at that. But um, Freedom Fest uh, had a slate of very interesting speakers covering the spectrum of many things. Uh, Steven Pinker spoke there. Matt Ridley, Michael Shermer uh, talked about atheism and science and rationality. Uh, Ice T, the uh, former self-styled pimp uh, military veteran. Uh, and a uh, longtime actor and, uh, you know, rock act, uh, the head of Body Count, the wonderful uh, 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 late 80s kind of thrash metal band, kind of hip or kind of rap. I'm not sure how to quite qualify it, but um, he and uh, Kennedy of uh, MTV and of Reason and of Fox News uh, had a great conversation where Ice-T talked about uh, both the freedom of speech. He was uh, subjected to a lot of uh, soft power and jawboning by federal officials, as well as culture people in the late 80s, 
for the song Cop Killer. Uh, he also is a big Second Amendment uh, rights guy. Uh, that was fascinating to hear, you know, a black actor, military veteran, rock performer, cross categories in a way, you know, somebody like Killer Mike does that today, et cetera. But it's always interesting when they blur the categories. The actor Rob Schneider, who's been a long uh, time vaccine critic, we'll put it, uh, also spoke and was pretty funny. Uh, RFK Jr. was there for the second year in a row. Uh, and um, so it, you know, what free what Freedom Fest did was it showcased all of the all of the um, kind of factions and fractures within the broad libertarian movement. I am happy to report that reason, of course, was greatly uh, represented wonderfully by uh, Jacob Sullum, who talked about his forthcoming book on the parallels between gun control and drug control. Uh, Robbie Suave gave a fantastic talk about the falseness of the whole misinformation kind of industrial complex. I talked about uh, what I call the agony of abundance, about how many of the arguments that we're having in America, not for, because of scarcity of resources, but rather the fact that we basically are now arguing over symbolic uh, uh, aspects of everyday life and the meaning of life and things like that. Uh, one of the things, and I'll leave with this, is that we... Um, uh, a, a lot of people who I talk to, uh, besides the ones who were th trying to throw acid in my face, uh, <laughs> were very uh, extremely positive about reason. And even some of them, even some of the acid bathers, um, were what um, what they like about reason is the optimism and the forward, not just the forward momentum, but the forward orientation to how how do we make the world a better place and how do we make it more open rather than more kind of truncated, more closed, more pessimistic and more narrow in in what people are able to do or how we're able to conceive of the good life and how we interact with people. So Freedom Fest, uh, there are probably already ads going up for uh, buying tickets next year. But if you want to be among a broad swath of people who are in the libertarian movement, uh, it's a good place to go for a few days. Ice-T is a great underrated screen presence. Uh, one of these guys who's just always welcome uh, in, you know, usually in a supporting role. And in 1995, he had a fantastic year, like for me personally. His year was good for, for Peter Suderman because he co-starred in both Johnny Mnemonic alongside Henry Rollins and Keanu Reeves and also in Tank Girl. And like that's that's a that is a pair of accomplishments for the middle of the 1990s. Just a great year. I uh, next he's year, also, the next his, year his uh, only movie credit is for something called Franken Penis. Yeah, that's the uh, John Wayne Bobbitt story. By the way, uh, I'm still waiting for the bit. Rosen Penis uh, uh, pick yeah. spinoff uh, of Fletch to uh, come out. The yes. uh, uh, the other thing that is great, Google uh, Ice T for. Uh, there used to be, this was a very popular meme uh, series of where he would be explaining some kind of fake new drug on uh, Law and Order that was about to destroy the city. And they would be calling, you know, they call it holiday in kombucha. You know, you take one sip and suddenly you're, you know, you're running naked down Hollywood Boulevard, th things like that. It's uh, quite good. Catherine, what did you consume? I uh, both listened to a bunch of episodes and also appeared on a podcast that I want to recommend. Uh, it's called Chatter, and uh, it's from the folks, the Lawfare folks. Um, they have a whole bunch of different podcasts, but this one tends toward the uh, Gillespie interview, I would say. There are several different hosts, but um, my pal Shane Harris is one of the hosts. And uh, he and I talked about libertarianism and national security, so uh, plenty on that podcast to make everyone who has opinions about libertarianism and national security mad. But uh, just in general, great selection of mostly like new books that um, uh, they interview the authors of. Uh, I do also like that my episode appeared immediately before an episode about librarians. So you can choose like the libertarian librarian dichotomy is with us always. Um, it's uh, also a really good name for a podcast, Chatter, because you talking, to, you chitter chattering, but also it's about national security stuff. So, Chatter. Anyway, uh, I recommend it. And um, if you want a starter episode, you can start with the one that I'm on. 
Very good. Peter, what did you consume? Well, I really just want to talk about Johnny Mnemonic and Tank Girl now, but no, that but makes no I'm not going to do you. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so as I've mentioned on this podcast, I've been uh, back and forth between the North Shore of Boston and D.C. this summer. And so I watched the 1997, sorry, 1998 romantic comedy Next Stop Wonderland, which is set in the North Shore of Boston and very specifically all along the blue line of Boston's T system. Uh, like uh, all the different spots on the, like many of the, the, the stations of the, in, on the, the T line, which I have been writing a bunch to get back and forth between where I live and uh, or sort of where I've been up here and, uh, and the Alamo Draft House where I go see movies uh, downtown. Um, like they they appear in the movie. The end of the film is like the 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 two sort of uh, main characters get together on Revere Beach, which is America's first public beach, or at least that's the legend, and like realize how beautiful it is just right here, just a, a little ways north of Boston. It's so cute in so many ways. It starts uh, in downtown with. Um, uh, uh, with Hope Davis's character being left by her boyfriend, who is played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, a young, crazy, still like making his way up Philip Seymour Hoffman. And he's an environmental activist. And what's so great is that the end of the movie, he comes back and is like, environmental activism. It's a, it's a scam. They were just trying to, they, they, we saved the, the land for the Native Americans and they just built a casino on it, right? He learns that it's all, it's all, everybody is just out to, to build something on their land. You know, you save it from the development. And well, it's just a casino in the end. It's such a great time capsule in so many ways. All the clothes, all of the um, just sort of the, the, the like, it really looks like the late 90s look, the apartments. Uh, Sam Setter, the political commentator on um, uh, on uh, Air America, stars, uh, co-stars in this movie. He is one of the actors, like at like 22 years old. Um, and so, and the plot is actually, the plot is about dating apps, except before dating apps. So the plot is that the um, that Hope Davis's character, her mom places a, um, uh, what are those ads in the back of the newspaper? Um, uh, uh, personals I'm ad. And uh, a bunch of guys are like, we're all going to call this girl. And the first one to get on base with her wins the contest, right? So it's just, but it's just like, you could make this movie today, except about the apps. And it is just a reminder that uh, the dating has always been difficult and people have always been upset by it. And like, this, it's not the app's fault. It's just the fact that like being young and single and kind of a hopeless and like, not in love, like it sucks and you feel sad and forlorn. Um, on the other hand, if you discover that at the end of the blue line, there's a beautiful public beach, uh, maybe you'll find your true love and he'll be a marine biologist because it's 1998. Um, all right. Uh, I, uh, um, uh, am recommending a piece of art related to a, uh, acquaintance of mine, a colleague, uh, who died over the weekend, uh, Evan Wright, age 59, committed suicide, sadly. He was a great journalist, uh, LA character, although I don't think that's where he was living at this point in his life, but worked for Hustler, most notably at Rolling Stone, um, and his most prominent piece of work, and I recommend that people uh, check out uh, all of his work wherever you can find it, was a book, uh, one of uh, two or three that he wrote called Generation Kill. It came out in 2004. Uh, my recommendation is not that book, which I haven't read, but I've read uh, uh, some of the Rolling Stone work on which it was based, but rather the HBO miniseries that came out. Uh, in 2008, it is probably my favorite single HBO miniseries or like miniseries, uh, you know, post Roots and the original Shogun or whatever it was that we were watching back in the, in the days. Centennial, uh, Matt. Centennial. Uh, Centennial. Gosh, you know, uh, you're not wrong about that. I still bite sticks, Nick, just for a sport. Oh, yeah. Um, Pascanel. But, what can I just say, Jacques? Uh, it just is like uh, my giant puppy. Just, uh, I. Uh, Every single uh, person that I have uh, seen who has watched it or I know who has watched it uh, and who served in the military and particularly who was deployed uh, say it's their favorite piece of of uh, of art related to that. Like it gets the tedium of the deployment, the kind of like BS conversations, uh, late night philosophy, uh, ragging, just a bunch of stuff in there. It kind of gets the pace of that so well. Uh, he was a really great sort of neutral observer he helped 
with the creation of uh, that series, but it really is such a terrific piece of work. I think it's about seven episodes or uh, thereabouts. Uh, and like all great uh, pieces of audiovisual art, Catherine, it's ultimately about management. Um, uh, arguably one of the best ones out of all of those, right up there with Apollo, whatever that was, and uh, and Mad Men. Uh, Generation Kill is just a remarkable meditation on uh, on management. So. Uh, Seek that out first. Maybe work backwards to the Evan Wright catalog. Um, very sad day for a lot of us uh, to hear that he wasn't able to to keep going. Um, and that's that. Um, so uh, good luck, everybody, with uh, this political week and the, the climate that we're all living in. Uh, we have lots of podcasts. Uh, I don't know if there's some that are going to be uh, Republican convention themed, but go to all of them at reason.com slash podcast. Nick, I do know that we have some uh, New York events that you'd probably uh, wish to uh, familiarize people with, right? Yeah. Uh, the the one that I want to talk about is on Tuesday, July 23rd, and it's happening uh, downtown in Manhattan. Uh, it's going to be the premiere of a documentary about the Backpage, uh, the, the founders of Backpage who uh, were found guilty under a misbegotten federal prosecution. One of them committed suicide uh, en route to this uh, conclusion, and the other is waiting to be sentenced. But on Tuesday, July 23rd, we're going to be showing that. It is uh, done by Paul Dietrich and Elizabeth Nolan Brown, who will be speaking on an after panel about Backpage and what the prosecution means for freedom of speech and also freedom of sex. She'll be joined by Caitlin Bailey of Old Pros, a sex workers activist group. Um, and um, that you can get all the details at reason.com slash events. Uh, and you can also sign up for our New York City events at uh, reason.com slash newsletters at the NYC events. But uh, this July 23rd event will be uh, really fantastic. It's an incredible documentary of a, a very important not simply attempt, but actually successful, uh, you know, kind of action by the government to shut down free speech in the name of helping people uh, that will has inevitably will end up hurting more people. Uh, so please come out. And already has. Um, uh, so if you like what we do here as an organization, uh, please consider a tax deductible donation. Reason.com slash donate. We will catch you next Monday. Goodbye.